I've been talking about making a review of this book for years now. I think since it came out, I actually bought it very soon after it came out. And I think I got through the first chapter on heart disease. And I just, I couldn't do it. But I did do it like eight years later, but I, here I am, I did it. Dr. Michael Greger's How Not to Die, published in 2015, described as revealing the groundbreaking scientific evidence behind the only diet that can prevent and reverse many of the causes of premature death and disability. In other words, it's not how not to die, like how to live forever, but how not to die, how to prevent and in some cases even reverse supposedly many of the most common diseases. Dr. Greger has since released two more books in the How Not to Die series. He has How Not to Age about aging and he has How Not to Diet about dieting, weight loss. I have not read either of those books, so this review is specifically on How Not to Die, the first one. The book is split into two parts. Part one is on disease, and each chapter covers a different top killer in the United States, heart disease, diabetes, various cancers, and supposedly evidence showing how to prevent, treat, and even reverse some of these diseases. And then part two is on his diet recommendations, his daily dozen. Each chapter is on a different food, beans, greens, berries, various reasons why they are so healthy, again, more scientific research, as well as how much to eat each day. Let's start with the good things. To be clear, there are some things I really like about the book. I really love his chapter on infectious diseases. I think it's the best part of the book. He does a good, albeit depressing, job of pointing out all of the industry ties, industry ties to nutrition, to public health organizations that are responsible for educating the public on nutrition. He does a good job of dispelling some common nutrition myths, like that fructose from fruit is bad for us. It's not. Also phytates, that phytates are bad for us. They're not. Gregor cares a lot about people and a lot about people's health. I don't think you can read this book without that being the major takeaway. I don't get the sense at all that he is in this for the money. Nutritionfacts.org is a charity. All of the information on that website is free and pretty much everything in this book is available for free on the website, either in a blog post or in a video. His Daily Dozen is just right here on the website. There's also a free app you can download if you want to check everything off each day. It's a tiny little application. It downloads so fast. It opens up really quickly and like there it is there's no ads that's it he clearly wants to reduce the barriers as much as he can by allowing anyone and everyone with an internet access access to his information it's great gregor's diet recommendations his daily dozen it's very healthy i don't think many doctors or dietitians outside of like the few you know carnivore ones would have many qualms with this particularly since it doesn't amount to a full day's worth of eating a full day's worth of calories by my calculations it's around 12 to 1500 calories per day so if someone wanted to also incorporate some animal products they could if a doctor was really concerned about a patient not getting enough calcium without milk or iron without meat something like that and unless the additional calories being eaten eaten are all coming from animal products, processed meat, refined carbs. The Daily Dozen will likely reduce your risk for various diseases, maybe all of the diseases mentioned in this book. Almost certainly heart disease, diabetes, colon cancer, and obesity, given all of the evidence we have on those. Oh, and I love that exercise is included. I'm putting this in as a good thing, but I don't, I don't know if this is actually good or bad. But reading through this book, particularly part two, kind of made me feel like awesome. Almost every time Gregor points to some plant lowering your risk for whatever disease, like I already eat that plant. Half a cup of beans a day for two months could drop your cholesterol by 19 points. I eat at least double that every day. I'm gonna live forever. Now on to the not so good things. So Gregor does talk about supplements. He has a whole section at the end of the book. He talks specifically about B12, D, DHA, iodine, although he's super anti-salt, so he doesn't recommend iodized salt. Instead, he recommends certain seaweeds and canned beans with kelp, because that's easy to find. <laughs> All the other vitamins, minerals, and nutrients should be taken care of by the mountains of nutrition you'll be getting by centering your diet around whole plant foods. For the most part, yes, but what about calcium? There aren't that many calcium-rich plant foods, and Gregor recommends none of them as part of his daily dozen. None of them specifically, right? You have the greens recommendation, but it's not specifically 
bok choy or collard greens. Fortified plant milk is not part of the daily dozen. But again, the daily dozen is not going to meet all of your caloric needs. So if the rest of your calories or some of your calories are coming from cow's milk, then you're fine. But for the vegans among us, it is really important to include some of these foods in our diet every day. Selenium could be a concern too if you live in a country that lacks selenium in the soil, so your foods have less selenium. There's also like zinc, iron, protein, again, talking about vegans specifically, but those are probably going to be met by the rest of the food you're eating. Again, my main concern would be calcium. Let's move on to heart disease. Gregor thinks the effect of a plant-based diet on heart health is reason enough to eat a plant-based diet. He basically ends the book with this message saying that if someone tries to sell you on some new diet, just ask them if the diet reverses heart disease, has been proven to reverse heart disease. If it hasn't, why would you even consider it? Proven to reverse heart disease. That's a pretty bold claim, right? We should have some pretty good evidence for this? Lifestyle medicine pioneers Nathan Pritikin, Dean Ordish, and Caldwell Esselstyn Jr. took patients with advanced heart disease and put them on the kind of plant-based diet followed by Asian and African populations who did not suffer from heart disease. Supposedly, they were just hoping to stop progression of the disease, but instead they actually saw it reverse. Arteries opened up without drugs or surgery, even in some cases of patients with severe triple vessel heart disease. Sounds pretty amazing, right? Miraculous, as Gregor says. The evidence must be just incredible. First, let's look at the reference here. It's just an opinion piece by Dr. Esselstein. It's just Esselstein bragging about his own work and admonishing the medical community for treating heart disease as a life threatening illness instead of just a benign foodborne illness. So let's look at the studies, the studies that have supposedly shown heart disease reversal through a plant-based diet. There's the 1998 Ornish one on 35 participants that found those following comprehensive lifestyle changes saw their atherosclerosis, that is plaque buildup, regress after five years, whereas the control group saw theirs progress. They saw more plaque buildup. Sounds pretty cool. Sounds like a plant-based diet is pretty powerful, except you might notice I said comprehensive lifestyle changes. Yeah, it wasn't just diet. Patients were also supposed to exercise, manage their stress, attend group psychosocial support two times per week. Plus, the diet was vegetarian, not vegan. It was mostly plants, but it was also very low fat, 10% or less of total calories coming from fat. This is not something Gregor recommends anywhere in the book. So the most you can say is that a very low fat vegetarian diet, along with stress management, group support, exercise, reverses heart disease. Although no, you can't even say that because as Red Pen Reviews points out in their review of Gregor's other book, How Not to Diet, Ornish's study showed plaque progression stopped, yes, but not necessarily that it reversed. Some have argued that because the artery wall became more uniform, the diameter of the least narrow segment got smaller while the narrowest section stayed the same, this could suggest plaque regression. But this is ultimately speculation since the imaging method, quantitative coronary angiography, used to examine participants' arteries doesn't measure atherosclerosis directly and can therefore be misleading. It's worth noting that this study using the newer IVUS imaging found significant regression with statins alone. In fact, several clinical trials have found statins can reverse plaque buildup. But Dean Ornish is not the only lifestyle pioneer, lifestyle medical pioneer, what did he say? He's not the only one supposedly showing heart disease regression with plants. Caldwell Esselstyn, of course, and his five-year 22 patient study, they ate the same super low fat, plant-rich vegetarian diet, and all were taking cholesterol-lowering medication. Of the 11 patients that finished the five-year follow-up, eight of them saw a decrease in arterial stenosis, aka less plaque. As Esselstyn himself admits, there are a lot of limitations to this. For one thing, these were very sick, highly motivated people who chose to participate. Another issue is that there was no control group. They were all on medication, as I said, right? That's where a control group could have been very useful. You could have had one group on the drugs and following the diet and another group just taking the drugs, but unfortunately we don't have that. An uncontrolled longitudinal study where all subjects were on individualized cholesterol-lowering medications with sufficient potential to explain the results cannot be taken to show that diet has any causal role in the outcome. And yet for Gregor... There's only one diet ever proven to reverse the progression of heart disease. That's a plant-based vegetarian diet. This is Gregor's proof that heart disease is reversible with a plant-based diet. Two small, 
30-year-old studies that don't even really show that. And even if they were compelling, it wouldn't matter here because How Not to Die does not recommend these diets. He doesn't recommend eating 10% or less of total calories from fat. While he does recommend limiting oils, he never recommends curtailing consumption of nuts, seeds, avocados. In fact, there's a lengthy section on nuts and obesity and all of these studies finding no association between nuts and obesity. Nuts can be a lifeline without expanding your waistline. Clearly he wants us to eat these foods and not worry about overall fat intake. So the proof for reversing heart disease is not even proof, and even if it were, it would be for a super low-fat plant-based diet. Not to mention hours of group support and 48 minutes per day of stress management, which uh, don't think I saw that in the Daily Dozen. If he came out and said, a diet rich in fruits and vegetables and unprocessed plants is a great tool to help prevent and manage cardiovascular disease. Great. There's endless data to back that up. But it's that stretching, right? It's not just prevention. We, it reverses it, and we definitely know it. And by the way, it has to be the vegetarian diet. It's not just any diet rich in fruits and vegetables. It's the only one. So it's this temptation to exaggerate, to make it really specific and really unique and special. I don't think it's necessary to do this at all, and I think it looks really bad. Gregor does this sort of thing a lot, actually, using studies on wildly different plant-based diets to support his plant-based diet. In chapter six, How Not to Die from Diabetes, Gregor says that a fruit and rice diet can help reverse vision loss from diabetes. Fruit and rice diet, the Kempner diet, is... <laughs> Is that what Gregor recommends? He says in the very same chapter that American parents don't feed their kids plant-based for fear that their kids will not grow properly, their growth will be stunted. However, the opposite may be true. Loma Linda University researchers found that children who eat vegetarian diets not only grow up leaner than kids who eat meat, but taller too by about an inch. Vegetarian kids as in milk and eggs, as in a lot of milk and eggs. 75.8 times per month, that's about 2.5 times per day. Is that what Gregor recommends? That we feed our children milk and or eggs 2.5 times per day? No? Then why mention this study? Here is another example from the diabetes chapter. Gregor says that plant-based eaters get more of nearly every nutrient than meat eaters, including calcium. Can, can you, can you guess? Yeah, it's vegetarians again. And they were eating more dairy than the non-vegetarians. Is this what Gregor's suggesting? That we drink more milk than regular Americans? No? Then why mention this study? Why not mention one of the studies on vegans specifically and nutrient intake? Hmm, could it be because a lot of the studies on vegans and calcium specifically find that vegans get less calcium? And yes, that was all still in the diabetes section, which is another problem have with the book. Sometimes it's just not very well written in terms of structure. Stuff's just kind of all over the place. It feels like to me he wrote the book and still had a million references that he wanted to include, so he just kind of popped them in wherever. <laughs> like, yeah, we're talking about diabetes and pollutants, but hey, nutrient intake and vegetarians, and hey, did you know meat makes you gain weight? Anyway, back to diabetes. <laughs> Yes, How Not to Die has a lot of references, 100 plus pages total. It's like well over a thousand references total. I often hear this as a selling point from fans, and it's always kind of implied that like all of these references support a plant-based diet. No, they don't. The vast majority of these references have nothing to do with plant-based diets. A lot of them are just like simple medical facts or statistics, right? Like this many people die from liver cancer every year and it's a link to the CDC. So just for fun, let's look at chapter one on heart disease. Of these 60 references, I know it says 66, but there are six repeats in this chapter. Only 14 are on plant-based eating, that is 35%. And that's not even considering the strength of the evidence. It's, it's not like all of these are randomized controlled trials, no. We've got the Ornish, Esselstein stuff, which I already talked about, hardly proof of plant-based diets reversing heart disease. This one is just a letter to the editor. This one is another letter to the editor. 
editor. This is just a few case reports. Here we have an opinion piece. Yes, it's from the late, great William C. Roberts, but it's an opinion piece. It's commentary. That leaves us seven references. We've got two analyses here on data from the huge China Cornell project. That is the study that the China book is based on. The China book, the China study, the book. The first one using this data is on heart disease. They found lower total cholesterol and lower rates of mortality from heart disease in rural Chinese when compared to Americans. The Chinese ate significantly less animal protein. The second one is actually a book on the project going into the study design, basic data, and crude correlations, as they say. The ecologic study described in this book has only a limited potential to improve our understanding of the ideology of disease either in China or in countries such as the United States. Oh, okay. This one is commentary on another cholesterol study, a pretty interesting one, very small, 10 participants, three separate diets, a like modern day low fat diet, a Neolithic starch based diet, and then what they call a simian very high fiber diet, 55 grams per 1000 calories. Yeah. You can see the menus here. The volume on the simian vegetable diet is insane. 500 grams of Brussels sprouts. That's more than a pound. And that is just one one small part of lunch, right? Doesn't include the 300 grams of okra, 300 grams of peas, mushrooms, plums, hazelnuts. Like what? <laughs> And that's just lunch. Anyway, after two weeks, the starch diet performed well. Even the low-fat diet performed okay, but the vegetable diet just like blew them out of the water. But again, it's a lot of food. Considerable pressure had to be brought to bear on the subjects to ensure they ate all their food and did not lose weight. The foods were palatable, but the volume of 5.5 kilograms per day for a 70 kilogram man was excessive, and the time taken to eat this volume, eight or more hours per day, was a further limitation. How did Gregor cite this study? Plant-based diets have been shown to lower cholesterol just as effectively as first-line statin drugs, but without the risks. You don't think a little context is needed there? <laughs> What? Anyway, moving on, we've got vegetarian diet and cholesterol and triglyceride levels. That's the title of the study. It's not flashy at all, but tells us everything we need to know. I love it. Anyway, it's a small study comparing omnivores, vegetarians, and vegans. Omnis had the worst lipid panel, vegetarians better, vegans the best, of course, LDL under 70. Hell yeah. In this case, like again, it is one small study, but several others before and since have found the same thing. Vegans almost always have better lipid panels than omnivores and vegetarians, which makes sense. Vegans tend to eat way less saturated fat, more polyunsaturated fat, a whole lot of fiber. We tend to be at a healthy weight. Next, we have an RCT. 10 people given various amounts of Brazil nuts at different times, either zero, five grams, 20, or 50 grams. 50 grams is about 10 Brazil nuts. Then they had their blood tested at different intervals. 20 and 50 grams seem to significantly lower LDL and raise HDL just nine hours after consumption. And when tested 30 days later, their levels were still improved. It's pretty interesting, especially considering how low the participants LDL was to begin with, that a few Brazil nuts could potentially have this large of an effect is pretty cool. Raises a lot of questions though, right? Like if the effect is real, is it unsaturated fat? Is it selenium? Is it the rest of the diet? Because yeah, that's right. They were given the rest of their food as well. I have no idea what that looked like. It just says that it was balanced. Is it possible the diet they were provided was substantially better, maybe much lower in unsaturated fat than what they normally ate? When the intervention is cheap, easy, harmless, and healthy, we're talking just four Brazil nuts per month, then in my opinion, the burden of proof is somewhat reversed. I think the reasonable default position is to do it until proven otherwise. Shockingly, Brazil nuts are not part of the daily dozen. I mean, they are, you've got the quarter cup of nuts, right? Brazil nuts are nuts, but they're not specifically part of the daily dozen. You could just eat almonds or whatever. I don't know, given his enthusiasm for this study, I figured he would like make you eat a Brazil nut every day, <laughs> but then it wouldn't be the daily dozen, right? Be the baker's dozen? I think he makes that joke in the book somewhere. <laughs> Final source, we're looking at, in case you forgot, because I actually did while I was writing this, we're looking at all of the plant-based relevant references in chapter one. So this is the final one. It's commentary from Dr. Neil Barnard of PCRM. He's talking about doctors leading the way by not only recommending plant-based diets, but eating plant-based themselves. So taking it all together, all, all the plant-based specific evidence for chapter one, we have one huge observational study and a few small trials. That's Gregor's evidence for plant-based diets preventing heart disease. Is that enough? It's hard for me to say no 
because of everything else I know about this topic. As I already said, there are a lot of observational studies, a lot of trials on vegans, and they consistently show lower body weight, more fiber, more fruit and vegetable intake, lower LDL, replace some amount of animal products and refined carbs with plants, and you will very likely improve your blood lipid panel. I think virtually every expert would agree on that. But if I pretend I didn't already know any of that, I'm just relying on what Gregor provides in this book. No, it's not enough. Data on rural Chinese and like 20 vegans is <laughs> not enough information, not enough evidence for eating a plant-based diet. Brazil nuts potentially lowering LDL, as cool as that would be, it's not even a study on plant-based eating, right? It says nothing about the rest of the diet. And chapter one is not an outlier. The book is full of tiny studies supporting pretty big claims. Three to four shots of kale juice a day lowered LDL and raised HDL. 32 men. Urine from smokers given turmeric caused fewer DNA mutations when dripped on bacteria in a petri dish. 16 people. 90% of people with severe asthma saw their symptoms improve after a year on a vegan diet. 24 people. Broccoli eating smokers suffered 41% fewer DNA mutations in their bloodstream over 10 days. 27 people. And while Gregor insists the broccoli eaters were only given a single stock of broccoli per day, that single stock is 250 grams steamed. That's over half a pound. To wrap this exceedingly long section up, yes, the book has a lot of references, but they aren't necessarily strong support for Gregor's claims. They often are not. Oh, and as I already mentioned, there are a lot of repeats, like a lot. This is the same study cited four times. I want to go back to that quote from Gregor on the Brazil nut study because he does this a lot, right? He shares some small study on broccoli or bell peppers or mushrooms or whatever, and then says, yeah, it's a small study. It's not, you know, super compelling or it's just in vitro. We don't have any like clinical trials yet, but like, it's just broccoli. Eat the broccoli. On the one hand, okay, I, I can understand and kind of agree with him, right? Like, yeah, these foods are healthy. Even if Brazil nuts don't have a dramatic effect on LDL, let's face it, they probably don't. They're still healthy foods, so like eat the Brazil nuts. But if this is really okay, if it's really fine to make dietary changes based on a single small study, well, guess what? <laughs> you can do the same thing with animal products. Egg consumption may improve factors associated with glycemic control and insulin sensitivity in adults with pre and type 2 diabetes. So it's 42 overweight or obese people randomly assigned to either one large egg a day or egg white for 12 weeks. And the whole egg group saw a 4.4% reduction in fasting blood glucose. We've got some large studies too. 7,000 Koreans followed for 14 years in men. Frequent egg intake, two to four servings per week, was associated with a 40% lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes than infrequent egg intake. Now you could argue rightfully that the bulk of the evidence on eggs is neutral or even negative, right? Looking at eggs and health. So relying on just a couple studies on eggs that find positive results could be misleading which is exactly my point. When you do this, you teach people the opposite. You teach them that making dietary change off of single studies is okay. Hierarchy of evidence doesn't matter. The limitations of a study doesn't matter. What kind of blood do you want in your body? What kind of immune system? The kind of blood that just rolls over when new cancer cells pop up? Or blood that circulates to every nook and cranny in your body with the power to slow down and stop cancer cells in their tracks? He's talking about breast cancer cells in a Petri dish. Like, it's totally inappropriate. It's encouraging poor scientific literacy, and ultimately, I think it's hurting Gregor's efforts. What's to stop people who learn how to science from Gregor from seeing studies like these and going, oh, so eggs are healthy? It is not a good idea to play fast and loose with the science to help sell it. Because this is what's going to happen. We're, we're seeing it right here. Everybody else is going to play fast and loose with the science. Everybody else is going to misquote studies and misunderstand hierarchy of evidence and misunderstand everything to defend the foods they like. And the public doesn't know what's true anymore and just starts dismissing everything. While Gregor insists that he is not promoting veganism, more on that later, he seems to go out of his way to make animal products look as bad as possible. One of the most striking examples comes from chapter four on digestive cancers. He shares a study that finds white meat and fish to be worse than red meat in terms of colon cancer. But the bulk of the evidence does not suggest this, generally finding no correlation between white meat and colon cancer 
or for fish, no correlation or even a negative correlation. Fish consumption might actually lower risk. Another food Gregor really does not like is oil, any oil, even extra virgin olive oil. He says it may impair your arteries' ability to relax and dilate normally. He's talking about flow-mediated vasodilation, specifically this study where they gave 10 men meals containing fat from olive oil, canola oil, or salmon, and they found the olive oil meal reduced FMD by 31%. What does this mean? Probably not much. That postprandial, post meal state, um, having any sort of endothelial function in that state has never actually been shown to translate to higher risk of cardiovascular disease. That's just pure speculation at this point that that would lead to a higher risk of having a, a cardiac event. Theoretically, we could be very reductionist, zoom right in on exercise. I could get you to go and run, measure inf inflammation or endothelial cell function, showing increase in inflammation reduction in flow mediated dilation and without knowing any other information I could on paper say exercise is going to be bad for cardiovascular health. Yeah, I, I've made that comparison on my Instagram as well a few times just because I, I think it really illustrates the point because I, I don't think there's any debate around the benefits of exercise mm. at this point. So um, so yeah, it is very reductionist. It's very reductionist and a perfect example of cherry picking. The bulk of the evidence we have on olive oil suggests it is good for arterial health. It's good for our hearts. One of the reasons I put off reviewing this book for so long is because again, I bought it so soon after it came out and I just assumed because it's been so long, I would have to buy another copy. I'd have to buy one of the newer editions. Well, guess what? There is no newer edition. There's just one. So yay me, I didn't have to spend more money, but also what? What? This is supposed to be an evidence-based tome with thousands of references and it's never been updated? A lot can change in nine years. New studies are published every day. Some studies are even retracted. Ever heard of this guy, Brian? W Wansick? W I don't know. I'm not going to look it up. I don't care. He's a fraud. <laughs> he was a well-known, well-respected food marketing researcher. Was. He has had a number of papers retracted for falsification of data, duplication of data, errors in data. Gregor actually cites a couple of them in this section on getting kids to eat healthier. He's really fond of this one. Attractive names sustain increased vegetable intake in schools, which found giving vegetables goofy names like increased how, how many vegetables were bought, right? Kids were more likely supposedly to buy vegetables if they were called like x-ray carrots instead of carrots. So why isn't every single school in the country doing this right now? Bring it up at your next PTA meeting or don't. <laughs> Maybe don't. <laughs> Gregor is really unhappy with the way nutrition like public health experts spread information to the masses. He shares quote after quote from doctors and researchers saying something like, yeah, plant-based diets are best, but it's too extreme. No one will follow them. Rather than patronizing you with what they think is achievable by the masses though, I wish these authorities would just tell you what the science says and let you make up your own mind. First, this assumes that every expert agrees with his interpretation of the science. They do not. But even if they did, that doesn't mean that inundating people with petri dish study after petri dish study is an effective way to initiate change. Because the truth is, many people know they don't eat correctly. People know that chips aren't healthy, they eat them anyway. They know hot dogs aren't healthy, they eat them anyway. They know they're supposed to eat more fruits and vegetables, they don't. Many people are very sick. They have been told by their doctors to improve their diets and maybe they could reduce their medication. In some cases, maybe get off their medications. They don't do it. It's very much like veganism. How many people have seen slaughterhouse footage and been so distraught and upset by it and actually changed their diets. Not many. Yes, there are people for whom their dietary practices are just due to lack of information and they find out the information and they change and that's amazing, but that's not the majority. They are the exception to the rule. So if that's who Gregor is trying to reach, okay, but you're not reaching a lot of people. So while I understand Gregor's position, just give people the information and let them decide for themselves, I don't think that's actually the most effective. I totally understand the other side. That's like, look, people struggle with just the basics. Like they can't even walk for 30 minutes a day. They can't even meet the bare minimum amount of fiber. And we're supposed to tell them to like only eat plants. Come on. 
In the introduction, Gregor says that he's not advocating for a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet, he is merely following the evidence, advocating for an evidence-based diet, which just so happens to be a plant-based one. And by plant-based, he specifically means encourages the consumption of unrefined plant foods and discourages meat, dairy products, eggs, and processed foods. This makes it seem like he is totally impartial, but let's be clear, Gregor is vegan. He is an ethical vegan. He believes it is wrong to eat chicken and beef and milk and eggs. I mean, he's on Vegan Society's Research Advisory Committee. He wrote this article in 2005 about how talking about honey not being vegan hurts us as a movement. Again, he talks over and over about the importance of telling people the truth and letting them decide. And yet it really seems like he's hiding his personal beliefs. And it wouldn't be the first time. Do you remember when he intentionally included the last bit of a study because it encouraged fish consumption? So the top image is the original study. It's actually that one I talked about earlier on olive oil and FMD. And then the bottom image is how it appears in Gregor's olive oil and artery function video. Just happens to stop right after vinegar and before omega-3 rich fish. I agree that eating fish is wrong no matter how healthy it is, but you can't do this. And I do get why he says this in the book. It's pragmatic, right? I mean, speculation here, but you're probably gonna reach more people if you don't specifically say, hey, this is a vegan diet, I'm encouraging veganism. But I think pretending ethical veganism isn't an important part of what he does kind of clashes with his insistence that all the information needs to be given to people, you know? I think people reading his book should be aware that he is coming from an ethical vegan viewpoint, right? That that is a bias of his, just like it is for me. While the overall message of eat more plants, eat fewer animal products is sound, How Not to Die is advertised as an evidence-based book. It is not. Cherry picking is not evidence-based. Throwing out a ton of in vitro studies mixed with a handful of large cohorts and a few tiny RCTs and then presenting them all as like equally weighted, equally uh, convincing, equally strong not evidence-based. Or saying like, yeah, it's it's not super compelling. We don't have any human trials. It's just in vitro. It's just petri dish. But like, eat the broccoli. Not evidence-based. And then this, like, this is just downright embarrassing. But again, it is a very healthy way to eat. And I think the checking off stuff kind of thing, I mean, just for me, I'm like, ooh, I wanna, I wanna check it off. <laughs> like I downloaded the app. I wanted to see like how my diet does. I get pretty much everything. I don't get a quarter of a teaspoon of turmeric a day. I'll tell you that. But yeah, it is a very healthy way to eat. So if you want to try this out, if you want to do it, I mean, again, you don't need the book. It's right there on the website. Now, if you're looking to go fully vegan, I would not recommend Daily Dozen, at least on its own. I would highly, highly, highly recommend, as I always do, veganhealth.org, specifically the nutrition tips for vegans. Because again, eating the Daily Dozen does not guarantee that you will meet all of your needs as a vegan. Speaking of good vegan slash plant-based sources, I have a list here. I wanted to end on a, a positive note. Veganhealth.org, as I already said, the site is also totally free. It was started by registered dietitian Jack Norris. We have the veganrd.com by registered dietitian Jenny Messina. Vegan for Life by both of them, Messina and Norris. Great book. Nutrition Made Simple with Gil Carvalho is a great YouTube channel. I don't think he ever says that he's vegan, but he does have this section, it's actually in a video on Gregor, where he says that like, yeah, fish is healthy, he doesn't eat it like for ethical reasons. Is fishing an environmental catastrophe? Yes. Is it uh, ethically horrific? Yes. I personally avoid fishing on those, because of those reasons, but is it unhealthy to add some fish to a diet? No, the balance of evidence is overwhelming. So I suspect he's at least vegetarian just because like how many people don't eat fish for ethical reasons, but continue to eat cows and chickens? I, I don't think that person exists. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> anyway, the channel is terrific, actually evidence-based. I love his videos. Matthew Nigra, I just discovered him. He is probably the only naturopath I think is worth listening to. Very smart guy. This interview he did on the, the Proof, Simon Hill's Proof uh, podcast is excellent. And that's it for me. I would love to know your thoughts. I'm sure many of you read How Not to Die and actually started eating plant-based, even vegan, because of that book. It's why it makes it a hard thing to talk about, right? I don't want to discourage people from going vegan, but 
I, we also need to be honest, right? And I, I just don't think this is a good idea, right? Because it's not just about veganism. It's also about health. And it's also about scientific literacy. I don't want people finding small studies on eggs and going, oh, okay, I guess I'll eat eggs again. <laughs> or being convinced by carnivore trash because they just don't understand any of this. But anyway, I would love to know your thoughts. And thank you so much for being here. Please do like and subscribe. This video took I don't even know how many hours. You can ask my patrons. I've been working on this off and on for like a couple months now. Just like, yeah, it's coming out. Oh, wait, I took a break. And of course, thank you so much to my patrons and my members here on YouTube. They help me do what I do. They help me make videos like these that take like a hundred hours. I don't know. Is it a hundred? It might be. <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> I haven't even edited yet. Oh no. I do post two exclusive videos a month for tier two members and patrons. I do a vlog and I also do a controversial topic. Last month's was on AI. And yeah, that's it for me, guys. New video soon. Bye. I actually have way more notes, a lot more stuff that I did not include. This was long enough, but I do want to briefly mention salt. Gregor is super anti-salt. I think I said that early on. Um, I didn't make this its own section because consensus is still pretty anti-salt, right? It still encourages people, even if you don't have hypertension, to consume a low sodium diet. I agree with others who think it's probably not super necessary for those without hypertension to eat super low sodium. I suspect it's even less concerning for someone eating a Gregor type diet who's getting a ton of potassium. Point is, th this should be easy for Gregor, right? Because consensus is in agreement here. And yet he still finds a way, <laughs> he still finds a way to share just like, shitty evidence. Look, this group of people didn't see a rise in blood pressure as they aged, and that's because of a low sodium diet. But then you go to the actual report and there's nothing about sodium in the report. And then there's this other report that looks at these people as well as others who have, you know, low blood pressure and they suspect it's due to weight. I don't know. It's just frustrating. Okay. I do have to share the way he eats mango. Oh my God. When the fruit gets soft and ripe, I roll it between my palms, kneading it with my fingers until it becomes essentially liquid pulp in a pouch. Then I nip off the tip with my teeth, gently squeeze and suck the mango right out of its peel. <laughs> no, you don't get to eat mango anymore.